forgiven me for, the life that he took me from. It is amazing. The fact that he, to me it's mind-boggling that when you consider the fact that he knows each and every one of us intimately, it doesn't matter where you go, what you do, where you are, anything about your life, he knows every part of it. And to think that knowing us, he still loves us and gave his life for us. I can't think, it's like Brother Chad said on Sunday when we sang that song, Jesus is all right. I think even amazing, that's not enough for God. There's got to be a word that's, that's more. But I can't think of it. He is amazing. We can turn in our Bibles tonight to Psalm 119. We're going to read two verses of Scripture there. Psalm 119. If you're ever discouraged, if you're ever looking for direction, if you're ever looking for just God to speak to you, turn to Psalm 119. There's a lot of nuggets in, one in Psalm 119. We are going to read, starting at verse number 133. Psalm 119, verse 133. says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Then we're going to go back a little ways to verse number 105. For it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Lord, I thank you for your presence here tonight, Jesus, for your hand upon my life, God, and upon all those that are assembled here tonight. God, I ask that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would move in our lives, help us to hear your voice and to feel your presence tonight, God, because we give you all glory and all honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to speak to you for just a little while tonight on following God's path. Following God's path. Tonight I'm sure that we can all agree that life's path that each and every one of us are following, though they may be different, but they're all full of twists and turns and hills and valleys. Sometimes we can go days, weeks, months even, where we, the path just seems easy. And we can walk this, this road called life, and everything's going all right, and everything's just rosy, and everything's perfect in our lives. Everything's just going swell. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes along, and it's like they pick us up and drop us on Mount Everest and say, now you've got to climb to the top. Well, how am I going to get there from where I'm at here? I'm not ready for this path. I wasn't trained for this. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting this to happen. And something falls in our laps and something happens in our lives. And all of a sudden, we're all shook up. And we don't know where to turn and we don't know where to go. And we don't know how we're going to get through this path called life. And it just becomes overwhelming when we even think about it. But when you walk God's path, the way may not change much from the path that you were originally walking on. There's still going to be twists and turns. There's still going to be hills and valleys. There's still going to be those unexpected adventures that come along your way that you're not going to know how to get through. But the difference is, when you're walking God's path, you can know that God is in it with you. I believe that David says it best in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, we, I think we can agree tonight that David's life had a lot of twists and turns. We like to think of David as the king David. We like to think of David as the giant slaying David. But he had a lot of valleys that he went through as well. He had a lot of trials. He had a lot of tribulations. He had a lot of things in his life that just didn't go quite maybe the way he thought they should. So he pens these words and says, The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To be able to pen those words, to be able to think of the fact of what David went through, and he went through all those things. He, he went into the, the valley of the shadow of death. He, he got to that place. He, God did prepare a table for his enemies. He protected him, took care of him, and he pens the words that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Really, David, with everything you went through, that you can look back and think that oh, that's going to happen? Well, it will. God's mercy will be with you all the days of your life if you look to him so that we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you know that there is an actual valley that's called the shadow of death in Palestine? And every shepherd in that area knows of it. It's a very narrow defile through a mountain range where the water often foams and roars, torn by jagged rocks. The path plunges downward into a deep and narrow gorge of sheer precipice, overhung by frowning sphinx-like battlements of rock, which almost touch overhead. Its side walls rise like the stone walls of a great cathedral. The valley is about five miles long, yet it is not more than 12 feet at the widest section of the base. The actual path on the solid rock is so narrow that in places the sheep can hardly turn around in case of danger. As I mentioned to you on Sunday, I have a sometimes quite a vivid imagination. And as I read this description of the valley of the shadow of death, I can imagine a shepherd bringing their sheep along this path. Maybe there's a better, uh, better pasture for the sheep on the other side. But all along the way, light barely breaking over the edge. Walking along, you can hear the roar of the water down below. The shadows dancing around as the sun is kind of just barely poking through. And every step that you take, you're wondering if you're going to be stepping off into the abyss to fall to your death. You're wondering if, if the rock is going to give away. You're wondering if, if you're going to make it through to the other side every step becoming more and more dangerous than the last. And that's sometimes how we feel like life is leading us. We sometimes feel like we get into that place where we're in that valley of the shadow of death where we don't know if the next step we take is going to be the right one or the wrong one. We, we don't know when the, some events fall in our lap and things, our lives get tossed upside down. Which, which way do I turn and which way do I go? Everything's crashing down around me. I, all I hear is noise in my head and I can't even hear God anymore and I, I don't know where to go and where to turn. But what did David say? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. You see, David knew. No matter what was going on in his life, we know that he made a lot of bad decisions. We know that he got, him, got into circumstances and situations. I can't even imagine when they, when they return to the city of Ziklag and they find it completely burned out and they come and they, they realize that their wives and their children have been taken captive and everybody, even his own army, is looking at him and wanting to stone him because they weren't there to protect them. What was going through his mind outside of the fact that he knew that he needed to look to God? He didn't just cave in, he didn't just break down, he didn't just curl up and, and allow the men to do what they wanted to do to him. He turned his eyes towards heaven because God, I know that it's your comfort. I know it's your strength. I know that you are beside me and you're walking with me. And he sought God's counsel as to what needed to happen and what needed to be done. And in different situations in his life, he would turn to God. Where do I go, God, from here? 
What do I do now, God, with the situation which, was, which I find myself in? You see, sometimes life will throw twists and turns your way. With every bend in the road, every twist that you come to, every, every valley that you happen to descend into, every mountain that you think you have to climb, are you relying on your own skill? If they, somebody took me right now and, and dropped me off at, even all the way up at base camp at Mount Everest and said, okay, I want you to climb to the top. I can't do that. I don't know how to get there. And they could tell me, well, you just follow the path. Follow where everybody else is going. I would still say, I don't know how to get there. I'm not prepared for this situation. I, I don't know how to go this way because I can't do it in my power. Things are going to be, things are going to happen in our lives and, and we can say, well, I'm just going to rely on myself. Well, you may not be equipped to rely on yourself. Are you just trusting in your own judgment? I'm sure all of us have done that in the past. I know that there's times when I've looked to my own judgment. And there's, I've done that and then regretted the outcome from it. Are you being ruled by the emotions that rise up inside of you at that moment? Number one emotion that probably is going to rise up in, in any kind of these situations is fear. Never been here before. Never done this before. I don't know how to get past this. I don't know where it's going to lead me. I don't know where it's going to take me. But when we trust in God, when we look to God, that fear can go away. Because we can know God is with us. You see, I know the emotion called fear. See, as I've gotten older in this life, there's things that have risen up inside of me. And, and even though I know it's completely irrational, I don't know how to deal with it. And I've all my life, I've had a fear of heights. Brother Beer, pastor, a few people here experienced that fear of heights when I was working on my roof. First couple days I got up there, I was doing all right. I was picking up shingles, walking to the edge of the roof, throwing them off, and something happened in those day, few days up on that roof that got to me to the point where I couldn't even stand on the roof anymore. I'm crawling around on my hands and knees and, and woke up in the morning anxious and dreading having to climb that ladder to go back up on my roof. And then it got to the place where I had never experienced it, but it was shortly, I, I think it was shortly after that. I'm driving down to Kamloops. I had to go down for an appointment for my knee. I'm now, I'm all by myself. And I'm driving home and I'm coming down the hill by Savannah. And I start down this winding road down this hill. And you can see Kamloops Lake down below. It was a nice sunny day and it's shining down there. Suddenly, I start feeling lightheaded. I start feeling this anxiousness in my chest, and I, I realize that if I'm not careful, I'm just going to pass out. I suddenly, this fear is rising up inside of me as if something's going to come along and grab onto my vehicle and tear me off the road. And I realize that this is happening. I, I just concentrated on my breathing, and I, I began to talk to God, say, God, I don't know what's going on here. I, I don't know what's happening right now. I need you, God. I need your strength, and I need your power. I need you to get me to the bottom of this hill. And I slowed down my driving, and I just kept on just breathing deep, kept my eyes focused on the center line of the road. And I got down the hill, and the feeling went away. And I thought, where on earth did that come from? I've never experienced that fear before. It was just crippling, and it was there. The thing is that sometimes we get into situations in our lives, and, and things happen in our lives, and suddenly that fear steps in, and it paralyzes us. And what do we do now? Where do I go from here? How can I get past this? And that fear grips you and cripples you, and, and you can't even make a, a, a rational decision anymore because of the emotions that are rising up inside. But then you need to put your faith in God. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people were taken on a very winding path. And I'm not just talking about Moses wandering in the wilderness, but you look back through the history and you look back where they went and what had happened. We look into Joseph's life and, and he, he gets himself into this place. He, we know about the dreams that Joseph had, about the, going to his brothers and going to his parents saying, oh, I had these dreams and, 
and essentially they're going to be bowing down to him, and, and they mocked him for his dreams. And we know that Joseph was the favorite in, the, in his father's eyes, and his father had made him this coat, which signified that he was the favorite child, and his brothers hated him because of it. He gets to the place where his brothers take him, sell him off into slavery and to Egypt. It's a winding path that, that Joseph was walking on. But you see, from the dreams that he had all the way to the sale into slavery, that's what would bring Israelites into Egypt. But it was Joseph's faith that would indicate that he was on God's path. He was walking the path God laid out for him. Joseph may not have understood the path he was on. He may not have understood what it was all about, where it was going to take him, where it was going to lead him, but he never lost his faith in God. He continued to believe in God. He continued to trust in God. And the Bible doesn't go into details about him calling on him. But in Potiphar's house, he was able to prosper because of God. In Genesis chapter 39, beginning at verse number 2, it says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. That indicates that Joseph's faith wasn't wavering because God isn't going to make everything possible. If Joseph would have turned his back on God, if he would have just said, God, you've forsaken me, you've left me, and started just doing his own thing, I don't think that God would have made everything that he touched to prosper. God's hands remained upon him, and Joseph knew that God's hands were upon him. Because as the story progresses, as he continues to go along, we know that he in, in Potiphar's house, he was made to have rule in Potiphar's house. That Potiphar allowed him reign, allowed him to do all kinds of things. And then he got into trouble again with Potiphar's wife. Was falsely accused, ends up finding himself in prison. And then in Genesis chapter 39, beginning at verse number 21, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. And showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. Because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Joseph has a dream. Is hated by his brothers. Is sold into slavery. Rises to power falsely accused of, of, of going after Potiphar's wife, ends up in prison again. But God's hand is still upon him. God's faith didn't, or Joseph, Joseph's faith in God never wavered. He continued to trust in God. God, I don't know where this path is going to lead me. I don't know where it's taking me, God, but I'm going to continue to look to you. I'm going to continue to trust in you. I'm going to continue to believe in you, and I know you're going to get me through this. So then later he goes in and interprets some dreams for the, for the butler and for the baker, and, and they get taken out. And he says to the butler, he says, when you get out, remember me. Did you remember me? No. Still in prison until Pharaoh has a dream that nobody can interpret. Suddenly the butler remembers probably conveniently remembering to allow him some more favor with Pharaoh, I know a man that can probably interpret your dream for you. There was a man down in the prison, and he interpreted for me, and what he said came to pass. So Pharaoh brings Joseph out, says, I want you to interpret my dream. And in Genesis 41, 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. All along this way, God, I need your hand upon me. God, I'm going to trust in you. God, I'm going to believe that you've got a plan at the end of all of this. I believe, God, that you're going to take me through. You're going to get me to the tip of Everest, God, if that's what it's going to take. You will take me there. And he kept believing, he kept trusting, kept knowing that God's hand was upon him. Not knowing where the path is going to lead, but knowing that he's on God's path. Gets to that place, well, you need to interpret this dream. I can't interpret your dream, Pharaoh. God will interpret your dream. He gave the credit, gave all the glory to God. 
In the end, he would find out why his path led him the way he did, the way it did, why it took him to that place so that he could be in a position to stockpile food, to be in a position to be able to call on his family, to bring his people down into Egypt so that they could be saved. And the Israelite people would remain there for many years where they would once again then find themselves in bondage. This is a winding path that God's people are on, taking them all over the place. You see, but it was in this time of bondage that a cry went up to the Lord. God, we need you. God, do you see us in this bondage? Do you see us here in Egypt as slaves, doing what the taskmasters tell us, making bricks, doing all of this work, being whipped and beaten? Do you see us, God? And the cry went up to the Lord because they were trusting in him to set them free. So God chooses a man that we know Moses. And Moses went into Egypt, back to the place that he had run away from. And there he goes in and goes through the trial of the plague, all of the ups and downs and the twists and turns that that would bring. Again, God not fully revealing his plan. I want you to go to Pharaoh and say this. And when he does this, this is what you do. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Then he comes out, and God says, well, I've hardened his heart. He's not going to get them free. I want you to go in and do this. Okay, God. He goes in and does this. Okay, I've hardened his heart again. But the thing is, Moses continued to trust God. God, if this is what you want, you've brought me this far, God. So they get through the trial of the plagues. They get through all of that. Okay, soften his heart. Pharaoh says, okay, take your people and go. Give them gold. Give them what, everything that you can so that they go. So they leave. God hardens Pharaoh's heart again. Another twist to the plot. They find themselves up against the Red Sea. People begin to murmur, begin to complain. You brought us out here just so Pharaoh could come and kill us? God takes them through the Red Sea. Wipes out Pharaoh's army. They get out into the wilderness. They begin to murmur and complain. Oh, you brought us out here. To, we're going to die. We have no water. He smites the rock, gives them water. You brought us out here to die. We have no food. God rains manna down from heaven to feed them. Oh, Moses, you took too much upon yourself. I don't think that you should be the leader. And God wipes out a bunch of the people that came against Moses. Winding path. And then for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness, but not alone. For 40 years, they wandered following God's pillar of fire by night, that pillar of cloud by day, setting up the tabernacle, taking it down, moving when God was moving, following God through that wilderness. God was with them every single step of the way till he finally brought them through to the other side. God walked with them. It was God's path. They wandered in the wilderness because of their own stubbornness. They wandered in the wilderness because of their own hard-headed attitude. But God was with them. God took them through. God made a way for them. God fed them. God watered them. God was with them. You see, this message is not in the path that you're walking. But rather, this message is in who are you following. As I said earlier, th your path, the path that God has for you is not going to be that much different than the path that you're already walking or that you might have walked before. It's either way, it's going to be full of twists and turns. But when you're walking without God and something lands in your lap that you don't understand and you don't know how to get around and you don't know what you're going to do with it, then you start relying on yourself and you get yourself into a bigger trouble. You get, dig yourself into a deeper hole. But when you're walking God's path, then when something falls in your lap that you don't know and you don't understand and you don't know where to turn, you turn your eyes to God and say, God, how do I get through this? God, how do I get past this situation? God, what do I need to learn from this situation? And God will reach down and he will give you the strength that you need and he will guide your, uh, gu guide your steps and order them and take you through to the other side. He will walk with you. He will walk right there beside you and like the poem footprint says, that when you stumble and fall, when you can't go any further, he will pick you up and carry you if he has to get you to the other side. That's what it means to walk God's path. We read in the beginning, 
Psalm 119 and 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So now imagine walking through that valley of the shadow of death. where the light's only barely breaking through the top, where the shadows are moving around, where you're wondering about every step that you take. But now you hold out a lamp. I can see clearly the path now. Every step is going to be sure. Every step is going to be where it needs to be. I'm not going to be walking close to the edge, but I'm going to stay safe. That's what God's word does for us. As we walk this path called life, thy word will be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, that no matter where I go, no matter where I walk, doesn't matter whether I turn to the left, whether I turn to the right, whether I go down into a valley, whether I'm climbing a hill, his word is going to be a lamp unto my feet. It's going to guide my path. It's going to guide my steps. It's going to lead me to safety, and it's going to keep me from the enemy, and it's going to keep me safe from my own strength, from my own thoughts, from my own emotions, and from what I deal with and the decisions that I would make. You see, following a path that you cannot see clearly, every step is going to be a danger. But then you realize that God is with you. Again, his word becoming that lamp unto your feet, that light to your path, illuminating your way. This can only happen when you put all of your faith in him and all of your trust in him. Your path will always have twists and turns, but when you're on God's path, he'll light the way. But some of those twists and those turns, now they're not a surprise to you because you can see them coming. You can see what's happening around you. Notice that it's written in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Verse 14 has always been a little bit of an enigma for me. The way, just the wording of that, straight is the gate. I think of something straight, something is, is straight. How can a gate be straight? A gate's an opening. I'm thinking the path should be straight, but the path isn't straight. So then I looked into it a little deeper today. When you look at the words that are translated in verse number 14, straight, the Greek word is stenos, which means narrow. Okay, so narrow is the gate and narrow is the way. That saying kind of the same thing. So then I looked at the word narrow, which the Greek word is plebo, which means afflict, suffer tribulation, or trouble. So if you look at that in verse number 14, because narrow is the gate, that I understand. It's a narrow place to get in. And tribulation and trouble and affliction is the way which leadeth unto life. I'm here today to tell you that the God's way, following God's path, does not mean it's going to be easy. When you say, I'm going to follow you, God, you better understand that you're actually looking for trouble. Now, I'm not trying to scare you because God will be with you in that trouble. God will be with you in that tribulation. God be, will be with you in your affliction. But he's saying you're going to have to go through this and know that I am with you in it. Right. You're going to have to endure this and get to that narrow gate. Because broad is the way, wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. And I think of those two things, and I think of a broad path. 
easy. If you've got a broad path, there's a few roads that I've driven down, especially with this newfound fear of heights driving. I found myself a few times on a narrow road where there's a drop off on the edge and I get really anxious when I start thinking about that drop off and, and how narrow the road is. But I've been on some worse areas where the road is really wide. And it's not so bad. And I don't get that anxious feeling. I don't get that fearful feeling down in my heart because it's safe. It's easy. I can do this. So I think of that wide path, that, that broad way that we can take. It'll be an easy way to go. Well, you see trouble a little bit over here. Oh, I'm going to go. I'm going to stay way over on this side. I see affliction coming over there. Well, I'm just, I can go way over around it this way. Don't have to bother me. But that narrow gate, that straight gate, that's the aim. I've got to hit that gate. The path that goes there is a winding path. And when I come on down that path and I see affliction coming, well, I can't avoid it. It's right there in front of me. There's tribulation coming right after it. But God is with me. God will be my strength. God will be my protector. God will be my shield. Why? That's the reason why David could pen those words. Because David experienced God's touch. God exper or David experienced God's protection. David experienced God's hand upon him throughout his life. That when he went into that battlefield against the giant, he went out there with a sling and a few little stones against a proven warrior with a sword and a shield. And when he went out onto that field, he didn't meekly hide behind rocks and go out there. He ran out into the field and said, the Lord is going to give you into my hand. He knew God was with him. God was going to be the one to deliver him. God was going to be the one to get him through that trial. So when we come along and, and now something happens in our lives and we find that twist that we weren't expecting, God's going to get me through it. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to fret about it. God's going to take me through to the other side. When that other turn comes along that we weren't expecting that one, well, God was with me back last week in that trial. He's going to be with me this week in this trial. And he's going to help me through this. And the days are coming. I don't think we've seen trials yet. We haven't seen tribulation yet to the likes of what we're going to see. We need to believe that we're on God's path. And we have to stay on God's path and believe that God is going to take us through. You see, when you think of that straight gate and that narrow way being a narrow gate full of a, and the way being full of affliction and being full of tribulation and being full of trouble, how much more do we need to trust in God because we can't go it alone? We aren't going to make it if we try to do it alone. We also read at the beginning Psalms 119 and verse 133 that says, Order my steps in thy word and not, let not any iniquity have dominion over me. See, when our goal is that narrow gate, when we realize that trouble waits for us, our enemy wants us to fall into iniquity. He wants us to trust, to lean on to our own understanding, not trust in the way of the Lord, so that we will stumble and we will fall. But we need to know that God is going to be with us. Psalm 119 and we're, verse 133 should be a prayer that we pray every day. God, order my steps in thy word. And let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Every day we should be praying that. God, order my steps today. No matter what comes my way today, order my steps. Take me through whatever I have to go through today. Whether it's something that we have to deal with at work, whether it's customers, whether it's employers, whether it's co-workers. Whatever it is, when we go shopping, whatever we do in town, we should be praying that. You see, David pen these words, and David was a man just like you and I. He had his moments of triumph, which we like to preach on because they build encouragement, but he also fell due to temptation, fell due to his own lust. But David never lost sight of God. Even when he fell, and when his con sin, when he was confronted with his sin, he didn't deny it. He repented. He still had the price to pay. 
but her, uh, his eyes were always on God. Psalm 137, or sorry, Psalm 37, beginning at verse 23, says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in, this, in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hands. I have been young, and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Verse number 25 indicates that as long as you keep your eyes on God, as long as you are trusting in him, believing in him, doing your best to live for him, walking his path, he's never going to leave you. When you fall, you should not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. When you fall, God's going to reach down and say, take a hold. There is safety here. And he'll lift you up. And he'll keep you. See, there's no greater path that we can walk than walking the Lord's path. I believe that in the days which we live today, more than ever, we have to keep our eyes on that narrow gate, that straight gate, knowing that there's going to be affliction knowing the trouble that we've never experienced before is coming our way. And not to get fearful thinking of those things, but to say, God, you are with me. God, your rod and your staff, they're what comfort me. I'm going to take a hold of your word, God. I'm going to let it be that lamp unto my feet, that light unto my path, that you're going to shine the way before us. Because there's going to be situations coming that we're not going to understand how to get past. We're not going to be able to get through them on our own. As Sister Z comes tonight, there's a lot of different things and a lot of different theories going on in the world right now. A lot of, and I know the Bible says, no man knows the hour or the day. But it's interesting when you look at what the Bible says and you look at things and events that are happening just in the stars. Revelation 12 talks about a woman travailing with child, having a crown of ten thorns above her head. People that watch the stars, the constellation, I think it's Aries, which is a woman, is lined up. So the Bible says that the moon will be under her feet. Apparently, if you look at the constellation right now, that's exactly the way it's lined up, with 12 stars over her head. And it says that there is a child in her belly, in her womb. And there's a comet, apparently, that is, spo that is supposed to be appearing, coming from that direction as well. Oh, it's just, it's just people putting stuff together, trying to make the Bible seem like it's real. Trying to bring prophecy to life that's not really coming to life, is it? I tried to do a little bit of research today because I, the UN apparently is having this meeting in New York right now. And they're signing this some kind of a, what I had read was it was a peace treaty. I couldn't find anything about it being a peace treaty. But they're signing it in the year 2023. And it's all to do with things in 2030, in seven years. Conspiracy theories? Who knows? All I know is that when we read about what the world's going to be like in the last days, and we're seeing evidence of it now, we need God. We need to keep our eyes on Him and our trust in Him, because if we lean to our own understanding, if we start to try to figure things out on our own and think of how we're going to get through this on our own, we're not going to make it. We need to believe in God and trust in God. Why don't we stand together tonight? I think that we should also 
pray Psalm 23. Psalm 23 again says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think that's a good thing to pray. And ask God to be with us. To lead us by the still waters. To restore my soul to lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That we will fear no evil because he's the one that brings that comfort. Why don't we just pray and talk to God tonight and ask God to be with us to walk